Hey, what's up? This is your girl, Diamond. I am so excited to have this person here because they are a local Houstonian that I have been seeing around for, shit, a decade now. I think the very first time that I met you, we were at an event. It was you, Amir. It was some kind of event at the Montreal Center. I can't remember. Years ago, I think either um, your organization was in its infancy or... um, you were working for somebody else. I can't remember exactly what, but it was some type of meeting where we were talking about, um, you know, something revolving probably like HIV or something like that. And I had met you and I liked everybody energy in that space. And I was like, oh, this is fire. So anyway, I am so happy to be in community with this type of person because Everybody is not real. A lot of times people are putting on a show, putting on a face. And one thing that I loved about you is that you were always honest and it didn't feel like you were cold switching. It felt like you were just being yourself um, unabridged, just kind of just doing you. And I always resonate to people with that kind of spirit. So I want to welcome to Marsha's play, Ian Haddock. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes. Welcome me, welcome me. I'm finally on the platform, baby. Um, we love to see it. We love to see it. I always call you. It's you and little Richard are my spirit animals. So we're gonna have a good time. <laughs> love that. <laughs> um, so how long have you been in Houston? So I've been in Houston on and off since uh since I graduated high school in 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, Houston is home, both literally and figuratively. Um, this, this, this city saved me, this community, more specifically the black queer community, um, saved me, um, and made me who I am. And so, uh, in a, in a cool way and not a a bad way, but in a cool way, I'm indebted to this community and I, I ride or die for the community that raised me. So I love Houston. Mm. Who are the who are the people who kind of so growing up even further back in high school, who were the people that kind of loved on you and raised you and kind of molded who you are as an adult? Who are those people? You know, I was actually just like reminiscing on my childhood and there are like a couple of things that made me laugh. One, everybody knew I was gay before I told them. Um, Certain people didn't like it, but for the most part, all my family laughs at me because I was really feminine. You know, I think I've, I think I have because of like the culture, I've gotten more quote unquote masculine, whatever that means, as time went on. But I was a sissy, you know what I mean? But I enjoyed being a sissy. Okay, (laughs) so that's one. Um, And those were like my cousins because also I'm like the the youngest of my generation. My mama had me really late. My oldest brother, well, my middle brother is seven years older than me, and he was the youngest person in their generation. So when I was 10, everybody was like adults. And so my my cousins, they rallied behind my sissified ass. And I really appreciated that. Also, my mama was a strong black woman. Uh, you know, in this in this world right now, people would say that she was abusive. And she was, but <laughs> I really appreciated that because she said what she was thinking. Um, when people say how authentic and how real I am, I really automatically feel the embrace of my mother because people didn't use that language for her because of how she talked. But my mom was very much the person to be like, did this nigga come out your pussy? Well, you can suck my dick. That's, that's very much how, how she... Oh, come on, mom. <laughs> so my mama... Definitely. And then um, church. I was a church queen for sure. I love church. My mama, she went to church on and off, but I was in church five five to seven days a week. I just loved everything about church from drill team to the choir. I was a church queen for sure. So um, there were a lot of, uh, I learned a lot about queerness in church and how to speak and how to be present and how to lead meetings and lead organizations. Um, And I think oftentimes, you know, we don't give a lot of credit because there is a lot of trauma that comes with the Black Christian church specifically, but also there's a lot that we learned. I didn't go to college. Um, well, I dropped out of college my freshman year. So what I know about leading came from being in church. Mm-hmm. And so those were three places that I, I automatically go back to when I think about like my childhood. 
some of the my initial moments of you know public speaking so my initial moments of you know learning how to engage with a group of people and get and corral them and get them to do what you want them to do in regards like if y'all are trying to get a meeting together my early memories of me doing that um were definitely in church early but definitely somebody saw something in me that that seemed like a leader that seemed like some I, you know usually they they they'll say something like oh you're articulate oh you can speak well so i read really really well so if it was time to read some scripture in the in the um bible study um, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, then I'm going to be the one that's going to read the scripture with that kind of flair that they like. And it, and it might necessarily not necessarily had that that feminine flair when I was a kid, kid still was feminine, but not the kind of huh, the jazz, the sass that you get from community. <laughs> um, but it still was very articulate and very um you know, charismatic. charismatic and flowed really well. One of the yeah. things that my teachers would say, um, it was it's I, I was reading it as if I had read it before. I was reading it as with so much without the stalls, the pauses and the stops. And I get that from being in church and being able to read and the joy that it got me, the attention that it got me while I was in church. When I, you know, they're going to praise you if they if you if you performing like they want you to. Oh, they're going to praise you. They're going to pat you on the back. They're going to pat you on the head or in some sense of that, in some in some sense, um, especially if your queerness hasn't. Um, if you hadn't said, oh, I'm queer now. If they just sense it and they, you, you're too young for them to call it out, then they'll be like, oh, yeah, let's lead you in the right direction. But I totally agree with that. I think church is definitely a breeding ground for. And it can be negative and positive, but mm-hmm. that kind of respectable black little boy or black little girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a, a lot of the language that they use. And I think it for me, since I do come from a country town, I'm from um, it's not super country anymore, but it was. I'm from the Mark, Texas, and also Texas City, Texas. And so, um, like coming from such a small town that had low literacy rates, some of the language they used, they didn't even know how they were crafting who I was becoming, right? They love to say, oh, you're called. You're just saying that I'm a leader. You're just saying that I'm a yeah. right? Yeah. You're just saying that I have, I'm shining, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of that stuff really has like cultivated uh, who I am. I, I speak to people so effortlessly, even though I'm naturally an introvert, but I speak to people so effortlessly because I learned how to turn it on at church. I wanted that applause. Like you said, I wanted that applause. I wanted that pat on the back and you turn that on. But then at some point you start to say, hold on, I, the more authentic I am, even in church, the more authentic I am, if I say something that really pierces people, they move different, they treat me different. And right. so um, I, I was talking to Harrison God one day and he said- like, Hey Harrison, we love you. <laughs> hey, yeah, I was talking to Harrison God and he said, like we learned how to build community because we went to church. And there was a lot of negative shit that happened with like being in church and being a, a, a a more feminine person in church, but there were a lot of great things that I learned and that I I gleaned from that experience and uh, that I even use now. Like you know, when I hook up, I'm very you know daddy like. I learned that from my pastor. You know what I mean? Move. <laughs> <laughs> When did that start to shift? So you're talking about, you know, uh, us finding comfort in that kind of church setting because you're getting these kind of lessons and, you know, you and kind of when you're young, you don't know about other culture. When did that culture, you know, the being in a church and being in your family in whatever way it was, when did that start to not be enough because you were growing and outgrowing that kind of those kind of walls? What When did that start to happen? So I come from a very poor family. Um, when I'm talking about poor, I'm talking about my grandparents were not as poor. They were pretty middle class. So they bought this this uh, house and they bought two houses next to it, which were 
322 and 322 and a half. And then they had 318 and 318 and a half. I mean, you no, know, you know, you're in the country. I ain't hear no halves until I went to the country. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get no halves. <laughs> so their, their goal was to have places for all of their kids to live if their kids, you know, something happened to them. Well, my mom had a lot of issues, but potentially. Uh, I say potentially because she can't answer for it anymore. She's passed away, but potentially even like drug use, even when I was born. And so we were so poor that baby, they connected the extension card from my grandma's house over the over the ground into one of our our things for us to have electricity. That's how poor we were. It was it, it was some real poverty over there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so <laughs> and so. Uh, church one was an outlet and so church um not only taught me a lot but it gave me my first experiences both gay experiences and getting out the city so i was a part of our drill team and i was a part of our drill team from i don't know 13 14 so i was probably like 16 17 and every year we went on a church trip and it was always out of town um sometimes one time it was in houston but we went to like florida and st louis so my first time getting out of uh, out of my my little town and i remember going there and finally seeing men because i would see them at you know at school and play with them at school but i would see like other men that like looked queer and i didn't even know what that language was what denomination were y'all baptist missionary okay, baptist. okay. yeah and so I would see people and we would get to talk because we would get to talk and all this kind of stuff. So I started making moves on people. Some people would turn me down, whether they were queer or not. But some people I would get to play with. And mm-hmm. so I started to learn how to finesse my way into sexual situations. And then I took those sexual situations, went back to the church and start finessing the local people, both at church and at school to, you know, get my, my sexual needs taken care of. So between me getting outside of the city and me starting to be able to finesse men into sexual relationships, I said, oh, I need to get to a place where there are more (laughs) men to finesse into sexual relationships. (laughs) Whore! (laughs) These walls got too small because I'm a whore! (laughs) And so, and so, um, one one good night, shout out to Randy Rochelle. Um, I got into Bartini. Mm. Uh, my my best friend was a couple give me years a uh, give me a year. What year was this? This is two thousand four. Two thousand four. Okay. I get into Bartini. Randy let my young ass in. I was sixteen, <laughs> and I get in there, and everybody's drinking. I see people fogging and eight counting upstairs. I see people shaking their ass. I didn't know it was. You know, I didn't know what bounce music was at the time. I'm seeing all these kind of things. And I'm looking around like a kid in a candy store. I said, I got to get me some attention. Okay, wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. So let for people who are not in the queer culture that is listening, let me give you some dance kind of history. So Mm -hmm. What Ian is talking about. So, of course, the most because of the nature of culture right now, the state, the status of culture right now, most people know what Vogan is. If you are connected to queer, com- queer community, Vogan comes directly out of the ball scene. We've seen a lot of Vogan on polls. We, we received we seen it. You know, Madonna was one of the first instances where hip hop culture in her song Vogue. So we hear Vogue. Um, then we have a certain, he said, you've seen folks shaking their ass. So that can be kind of general, but there is a specific way that you shake your ass to bounce music there that, that comes out of new Orleans. And it has particularly in the South, there is a particular way that shake your ass that people like Katie red, um, um, Big Frida, you know, that comes out of that kind of culture that was happening in New Orleans that has spread throughout the South, especially in the gay community. And you see that when they put on bounce music, which is a, a, a type of um, dance music that come out of New Orleans, and you'll see that in the club. Also, Ian just was talking about an eight count. Now, me, I, 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 I went to Jackson State University. So <laughs> this is eight counting comes from um, 
you know, uh, like the majorettes of HBCU schools, our particular school is called the J set. So when you hear people talk about it, you hear them saying J setting. And because <laughs> our major Brett's was the <laughs> baddest bitches and we get, we did all the, the things. And so the, the, it's a culture in HBCU where during games, the the majorettes, which is kind of like the cheerleaders of the teams, would be in the stands and and or be, and, and be doing different eight count dance moves through while they're in the stands. And it's a part of the whole culture of sports in HBCU culture. So, of course. Queer people are going to gravitate to the feminine energy that is being presented in that there. And, and the J sets had a gay coach. <laughs> <laughs> and you get what I'm saying? So that this is one of those incidents, you know, there's this, this, um, these things that kind of conversations that happens in the black community where we, especially when we're pushing up against white people taking our culture where, um, you know, queer people, black women will say gay men always steal shit from us. Not gay, white gay men will always steal shit from us. And then gay black gay folks will be like, oh, but y'all get stuff from us too. But there is, <laughs> but there is an osmosis that happened between the black gay um, men and women that happens with cis women because we are in community with each other. And it doesn't feel like a robbing of culture because we are we have always been in community with each other. So it's like a, always a, we get something from them and they get something from us. And this is a perfect example where our skills came together and created this thing and it has spread. So when we when we when you go to a gay club, particularly in the South, you are going to see J setting. You're going to see. um voguing you're gonna see um bouncing and that is these are dances that are specifically in our culture and i wanted to kind of give that kind of history and that kind of talk and so yes continue i'm sorry <laughs> yes we love to see it so i just remember thinking like i gotta get some attention like how am i gonna get attention i don't you know i don't i don't chase that uh i don't vogue i didn't even know what that was until i went to the club so mm -hmm. how do i do it um and I looked around to see if there was anybody like me. I was playing football at the time. You know, I'm still fine, but I was, you know, yeah, uh, not twinkish. I was always solid. Uh, but anyway, I heard through the grapevine that the guy that let me in, Randy Rochelle, did a talent night on Thursdays. And I said, best friend, we coming for the talent night. <laughs> and he said, what we going to do? I said, we going to strip. <laughs> <laughs> Not the church kids said going straight to stripping. <laughs> Word out. Oh, we had some we had some some Hanes panties on, some uh some regular little draws, and uh we was dancing to and I by no Pamas by Sierra. Never forget. And uh we did. We obviously did good. We won a little competition that night. But um, from then on, I just once again started to see how charisma, likability, sexuality uh, could really like get you attention. It was later I realized how that attention could also be negative. Um, but at that point, it was just attention. I'm this young boy from the country. I'm really figuring out what I like sexually. And my mama has been so um, restrictive and constrictive because my, uh, my oldest brother at that time was in jail um, and on his way to be in jail for life. My middle brother had, in, in 10th grade, was shot nine times. So he was currently in the hospital, which is why I can get out that <laughs> late at night. And so I'm like... Oh, this is something new. So I came home upset with my mama, you know, as she would say, smelling my pita jams. Uh, <laughs> because I now wanted to be like in this space. And so that was when it really all shifted for me. I just like it wasn't going to church on Sunday. It was trying to get to Bartini on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. It wasn't going to drill team practice on Thursday. It was trying to get to talent night so people could love me. Right. Right. Um, and that's when it really shifted. Mm, 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 mm. 
All right. So when did it start to? So I, I remember that time. I remember the joy. I, I, I described this on a, um, a a YouTube comment one time where um, it's almost like when Dorothy first come to Oz, it's like everything is colorful when it when the when it, the ship when she gets to Oz, it, it's colorful. It goes from black and white to like ooh, and and that's what happens when you get introduced to this community. It just feels like oh my god, everything that these are people like me. It is oh like oh my god, different type of people, but like this is like my tribe. And mm-hmm. then even if it's some stuff that you're not into dancing or, or the music or whatever, it still feels like, okay, this is home. But then once you're in it, you start to see the flying monkeys. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. start to see mm-hmm. wicked witches of the West. You start, start to see the negative that starts to come in regards to this. So Tell me, how did that start to shift? When did you start to see the negative side of the attention that you were getting? So it was hard. It was hard for me because I didn't even know we were poor at that time at home. Like, that was all I knew. So all I knew was being the dirty kid in high school. Uh, All I knew was, like, my mama would take me when we had Medicaid to the doctor. All I knew was, like, you know, she would take me to the doctor when we had our Medicaid good, or we would eat really well if we had food stamps. I that was just what I thought like normal people did. They got assistance from the government. So when I came to Houston and I'm like this all American scholar with very high grades, um, and now my mom is finding out I'm gay and she's like, Oh, it's a no. Uh, because I I I've talked about this before, but I came out because the school alleged, truthfully, that I was sleeping with uh, a male teacher. So that was my actual coming out kind of situation. And so my mom was like, hell no, nah, that father shit ain't going to be in my house. And so Wait, I just retreated. She, it was to you, but it was, what what they do to the teacher? Oh, uh, he, uh, he resigned. He okay. resigned. Um, and so after all of that, after all of that, uh, she was just like, it's a no for me. And so I retreated and went back to Houston because that wasn't going to change. Like I finally found my place. So when I got here, I think the first thing that kind of shook me was like, so where do I live? (laughs) I'm having a great time, but like, I can't go home. So where do I live? Mm. Um, and from where do I live? Like, how do I eat? And so I began to like have conversations with people at the club, like, where do people live? <laughs> like, because I didn't have I didn't have a concept of money. I didn't have a concept of working. Like my mama How never. How old were you? Uh, at this point, I'm probably 18. Uh-huh. Right. My mama never worked. She lost her, her good job when I was like four years old. At Southwestern Bell, that's how long it was, right? So she lost her good job. So from that point on, my mama had like part-time gigs and things like that, but she never worked. And so I didn't have a concept of work or get money or anything like that. And so one of the hardest things was me figuring out like, how do I actually exist? Um, And so like dealing with like homelessness dealing with uh like taking care of myself eating talking to people and a lot of the things that people will say is that you know that's why i smoke (laughs) that's why i drink because it's you know it's not easy and i'm like so it fixes it so i start drinking i start smoking like you know how else is this how you supposed to do it they say oh well you use that charisma you get you you get you some money you know, you get this money from these men that's, you know, you know, uh, giving giving you dollars on the show. You get, you know, you, you you use what you have to get what you want. Didn't make sense for me for a long time because I was fortunate enough to have people like Harrison and this guy named Calvin and Nathan who took me in. Nathan took me in for like the longest. Um, and but through that time, I was back in a in a maternal kind of figure state, even though Nathan is my father, it felt a lot like my mom. 
because Nathan was in school at the time also. He was working a frontline job, going to school full time, and uh, he stayed in the hood. So I was back at my mama's, you know what I mean? And, Sleeping on the couch. And Nathan has a very maternal spirit to energy yeah. to, to him. Exactly, exactly. And so I'm sleeping on this couch and he's cooking, you know, and we're, we're making it making it work. I think when it really, really shifted, um, when it really shifted for me was, um, and these, these are one of the reasons why I'm not in a relationship currently, um, but I met this wonderful guy. He was just not right for me the story of all of our lives, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and um, Nathan could no longer house me. He had to move in with one of his friends. And um, so I had to, you know, get out and get it on my own. And so I met this guy and he was a club head like I was. Fine, fine, fine. I'll never forget the first time we um, we we had sex together. He said, oh, it's like thick, thick white snot. I don't know why that's so important, but anyway, it was just very interesting. <laughs> uh, so, so from that moment on, I guess that was interesting to him because we never left each other's side. And he taught me so much on how to actually survive because I had so many questions. I wasn't doing like, I was working at a retail store, so I had so many questions. So he took me to Kroger. We went through the checkout line, the self-checkout line. He told me how to scan every other thing. Well, really, for him, it's like every five, every one of five things. <laughs> uh, we walked out of Kroger with, you know, using five dollars, about forty five dollars worth of groceries. Walked back to the to the room, and then on and on, he would teach me all these things that I thought were like really cool. Because again, no concept of money. Uh, and then finally, he he taught me how to place an ad. Uh, he taught me how to place an ad on Adam for Adam and Craigslist and. Uh, I think it was Men for Rent now at one point. He taught me how to place an ad, and uh, we hold together for about nine or ten months. Um, until and if you don't have no concept of motherfucking money when you start <laughs> hoeing, you you get it real quick because you get to do whatever the fuck you want because it's so much money you get. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was a it was a weird it was a weird time. So I just got really caught up and I'm I'm also like grateful that I do have some type of spiritual background because I was just really protected. Um some of the stories I have it's just like I don't know how I made it out of those situations. But that's when it really started to shift. When I started, it wasn't like the community itself. It was really I was for me, I think sex workers work. I think we definitely have to celebrate sex workers, but I didn't get in it because I wanted to like do sex work or because even I needed to do sex work, right? I got in it because I wanted validation and I wanted to be with that guy, right? And I think those are ne not necessarily good reasons to get into sex work. And by the time I was too in it, it was hard to get out of it. Mm. All right, so... Let me say this, because we are in a certain time, particularly here in Texas, where there is a political attack, attack on um, gay people, trans, trans people in particular, um, particularly around um, attacking and criminalizing their parents. Um, and, um, you know, in Florida, we got the don't say gay ban where, you know, they're just being quite extra about teaching about gay history and, you know, in regards to that. It's really important because what Ian is sharing with us is his journey into community because he lost his foundation. Whether it is partially a choice or partially a, I can't choose that this is now not a safe environment for me. And now I had to leave to go find that validation somewhere else. And part of that could be choice. Part of that, could, part of that like you said, your mama said, you can't stay here with that gay shit. So part of that is forced out. Um, when you, every, 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 every um, statistic that we could um, be, whether it be being, you know, you know, you get some kind of disease, you become homeless, you um, you, you get uh, addicted to drugs, any kind of negative statistic that you can be, 
one of the key indicators to lower your risk in being that statistic is your support system and your foundation, your family, your friends, your community, and having those people be a positive impact in your life, having those people be of sound mind and, um, and of, um, you know, just positive influence in your life lowers your risk in, in being a statistic and being those negative to statistics. And what Ian is sharing with you, as we know how research has shown that 40% of homeless youth are LGBT. And while some of us survive those dark times and come out unscathed um, for whatever reason, some of us do not. Some of us, it leads us into addiction. It leads us into taking risks, sexual risks that we shouldn't have to take because we don't have a place to go. Because, you know, you luckily found somebody like, um, found somebody like Nathan. You could have been, you could have been a person that found somebody that was a little bit more evil and said, oh, you got a prostitute to pay to sleep on my couch, or you got to sleep with me without a condom if you want to sleep on my couch. And these are situations that if we don't support our LGBT children, if we don't put our, if we don't allow parents who want to be supportive, we can put our youth who, like Ian is telling us, I didn't know any concepts of money or I didn't know any concept of, you know, sex education, particularly people who live in these rural areas that the, that that are led by Christian fundamentalists who don't want to teach you about sex, who feel like abstinence mm-hmm. is a way. When you're in those type of places you and you're coming into this world that you don't know anything about, you don't have any concepts of money, any concepts of what safe sex is, what is real and what's not real. And you could be coming into, you can be leading your children by putting them out on the street, leading them into dangerous situations. And this is not saying like the queer community is full of snakes. No, the world is full of snakes because you have just as, just it, just eat. If you put out your cisgender straight man or straight daughter, a uh, boy, uh, your son and, and daughter, you put them out and they cisgender, they could be in just as negative situations. So this is not exclusive to LGBT. It's just that that makes it even worse with us because it's just more likely that they won't like us and kick, kick us out because we gay or or trans uh, when it comes to our parents. And so what Ian is sharing with us, and, I, and I, I thank you for sharing this part of your story, is a perfect example of how he could have been in harm's way. Now he's sharing some good stuff that happened and he also sharing some negative stuff that happened. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect example. I want y'all to take from this conversation that this is why it's important for us to make sure that we are supporting the parents who are help supporting their children because we need it. So we're not out here just finding our way and running into landmines and running into these obstacles that we normally wouldn't have to, if we had the support system that, you know, a healthy relationship with your parents or a healthy relationship with whoever it is, is um, that, that that comes when they ha- you have somebody like that in your life. So continue. Yeah. And I just wanted to add, I just wanted to add this, this one thought for me, um, because, you know, my mama's relationship with me uh, shifted because of Nathan's relationship with me. Uh, and so although I just talked about like Calvin and Harrison, who are both mentors and people that I call father, one of the connections I have forever with Nathan is that my mother was able to, you know, before she passed away, because she did become my best friend, um, she was able to share with Nathan uh, that he taught her how to parent, mm. right? And so I also want to like just acknowledge the power of chosen families uh, because it's a dying thing in our community. Uh, we don't often talk about how important it is and how much, um, how difficult it is in this season um, to like have people that you choose uh, because it does many times come with all of these different things, like all these different things. But for me, when I say the community saved me, it literally was my saving grace. Yes, it taught me about prostitution and that's not, that wasn't something that I chose personally, right? Um, yes, it talk, taught me about alcohol abuse and uh, could, and could have introduced me to substance use, right? But 
also like the community when those things happened was there for me to lay on their couch was there for me to get my first job opportunity like you know nathan uh was a huge part of me even getting into the work that i got into right like all of those things and um you know i, I just think about like i mean we're talking about like the trans youth Right now, like I am feeling, you know, both personally, professionally, um, very challenged because this generation uh, gets me emotional. This generation, you know, people want to say they're lost. They're not lost. They're woke. And them being woke uh, makes some of the things that we are just really actualizing and realizing, see, when I get emotional, I have to grab something. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, but like they, they, they really want more and they deserve more. And they're not from like, cause I was in between a generation that my aunt, for instance, my aunt wanted me to go do a regular major, get a regular degree go into one job, work it for 30 years. And then when I retire at 60, be wealthy. She said, you have it in you. That's what you should do. Right. And so when I told her, oh no, I'm going to quit my good job at the county and I'm going to go like do my own thing. And I struggle every struggle. She was there to help me through every struggle, but every struggle like was another reason why you should have when it worked at math for like I told <laughs> do you. what I told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what's so interesting about it is like the other generation, they already own entrepreneur stuff at 18, whether it's only fans or you know their t-shirt business. So we don't know how to um, I don't know. Let me not say we I haven't figured out how to be the mentor that you know people like Nathan and Harrison were to me because they need something different. And um, during this time, you know, I've, uh, all of my work is like dedicated to things that are tangible and things that I can do now. I think, you know, working on the structure, doing policy work, all the advocacy, that's important, but like, I gotta be on the ground. What can I do now? And I'm just really trying to figure out and if any of the viewers can even give some tips on how do we be there? How how do we how do we be how are we being there for these these youth, specifically trans youth, more specifically for me, black trans youth um, that really need mentorship because they can't have their parent? And how do we support parents that are showing up? in this time with their trans youth as black queer people Mm -hmm. and make sure y'all yeah this is the perfect time for y'all to chime in on the conversation hashtag marsha's plate and let us know if you are a trans person now black trans person out there how would have you even if you are not in this younger generation if you were older and you've been through some of the shit that we have been through um what in what way could somebody have stepped in and helped you right now? That's tangible. Um, that and you know, of course, we know you can um, you know donate and give money to you and da 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 because you know we need that. That's money helps pay bills and survives absolutely. But um, what other ways? Not the, outside of money. What other ways could people have stepped up and helped you in whatever hardship that you had? Share not necessarily share the full detail of your experience, but how they could have helped you and how that would have impacted you. Hashtag Marsha's Play going forward past the situation where okay now you out here you out here in the streets doing your thing you know you living by these ronnie ho quotes <laughs> do, using what you got to get what you want you know uh so tell me you know tell me how did that shift how did you get out of that how was it now i'm getting older um lear- i've learned a little bit more what was how did that situation happen This is a real story. This is probably the first time that I've talked about it publicly, but I talk about it with my friends all the time. I was, um, I went through a breakup. Um, So uh, this guy that I was with, we had had um, a big fight and we were on a makeup spree. And he came down from college to uh, take me out to eat. And we were driving my friend's car to 
a local Chevron and got stopped by the police on MLK. And I had tickets. And so they took me in for tickets. And so I was in there and I was beating my head against the wall because I ain't built for jail. And um, <laughs> so he ended up, you know, paying the ticket and posting my bail. And I got out um, and I got in the car and he was just like stoic and straight faced. And I'm just like, are you not excited to see me? He was like, yes, I'm so happy you're out. I know that must have been difficult for you because, of course, I wasn't going to call my mother and I wasn't going to call Nathan because they both would have had a heart attack and I would have killed him. So I um, hadn't told anybody that this was going on. And so we were driving and uh, we got back to my place and he dropped me off. Uh, he sat on the side of the bed. He looked at me and he got up and left. And I knew something happened. I just didn't know what. So I laid in my bed, finally was able to go to sleep. I wake up and I got all these messages on Black Gay chat on BGC asking me, you know, am I positive? Do you have HIV? Did you give me AIDS? All this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, what? Like, this is weird that this is happening. So finally, I started responding to one of the people that I knew more personally was like, call me. Where is this coming from? He said, your boyfriend called me. Uh, he had went through your phone and saw that you were having sex with all these people. And he was telling us that we need to get checked because you're doing a, you're having a lot of unprotected sex. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. This just complicates everything. So now I'm nervous. Do I got HIV? <laughs> so I go get tested the next day. And I'm like, okay, cool. Now I can deal with my boyfriend that I haven't talked to. So I called him. I'm like, what? What happened? And he was just like, why you didn't tell me that you were escorting? Why did you, like, you making me look like a fool? I'm trying to, you know, I'm getting away from my parents. My parents are giving me all this flat, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, long story short, the guy breaks up with me, breaks my heart. He should have break, broken up with me, but it still broke my heart. So <laughs> my heart is broken. And I literally, I had a little part-time job. I stopped going to the job. Car got repossessed and I got evicted. And when I say evicted, I mean the sheriff came to the door to throw me out because I didn't leave. I didn't have no money. I didn't know I had nowhere to go. And uh, I went to um, one of my former suitors' house uh, and uh, he let me stay on his couch. But he was... Um, and I don't think it was intentionally trying to, I wouldn't say assault. Uh, if it was a woman of any experience, I probably would say assault. But it wasn't assault to me because he only knew me in one particular way. And it was very much like, you want to be on my couch? At least I'm going to be able to touch it or watch it or whatever the case may be. And so I was just like, I can't go back to this because that's why I lost my ex. And I really want him back. But I don't want to stay here. And I remember saying, I literally had a prayer, church queen in me. I prayed, I said, God. <laughs> <laughs> I always got to go back there. Train, <laughs> train, baby. Train. I was on my knees on the side of this man's couch one night. I said, God, this place is making me very uncomfortable. If you just give me one good trick, I'll leave this stuff forever. And uh, not praying I, to the Lord for a trick, baby. <laughs> That's when you know you're in the game. That's when you know you're in it, honey, because I done been there. <laughs> That's when you know you're in the bond, baby. You praying to God for a good trick. <laughs> and uh, I posted my Adam, Adam for Adam, and this guy hits me up. Never forget this. He said, I, we're building a Nabisco uh, factory here, and I can get you a job. And I'm just like, well, I don't, I'm not worried about a job. I need some money right now. And he was like, well, I can get you money right now and I can get you a job. And I'm just like, so how much the job paying? And he was like, $16 to $18 an hour. For me, that was like you telling me I'm rich. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know. <laughs> what year was this? This is, this is probably 2010, 2011. Yeah. That's a good point yeah. for 2010. Yeah. And you <laughs> right. right, exactly. So I'm like, oh, I'm about to get a coin. So I'm just like, well, let's, you know, we can talk about the other part later. How can I get this job? And I, y'all, I know this is going to sound like the stupidest thing that you could ever do. But remember, 
I had no concept of any of this. I this is like somebody handing me a lottery ticket. So he tells me, he says, "Well, because they haven't finished building the plant, you got to drive to Shreveport, Louisiana, this weekend. This is on a Wednesday. This weekend, we'll get you a hotel. We'll get you trained. We'll get you signed up. Get all your direct deposit information together, and we will. Uh, and you can you can start in about two weeks when." Uh, you know, when, when they finish whatever they're doing in Houston, I said, Oh my gosh, how am I going to get to Shreveport? So I go back to my friend. I said, friend, can you please drive me to Shreveport for this job? My friend was like, I know how bad you want to get out that man's house. I'm going to, I'm going to go to Shreveport, which is stupid. So we go to Shreveport. The man texts me. I hope you're not bringing anybody else because you're going to be rooming with uh, a fellow colleague. I tell him no, because I need the job. I said, I'll, I'll reimburse you the money for your own hotel room, friend. Just like give me the Shreveport. We get to Shreveport. My friend is sitting in the car while I do the interview. We're doing an interview in a La Quinta hotel room. And uh, after we do the interview, he said, hey, do you drink? And I was like, yeah, I love drink. I love to drink. I love gin and tequila. So we go get some gin and tequila. And, uh, the interview, man? interview man (laughs) (laughs) so um so we drink and he said tell me the truth did you bring somebody here and i was like man yeah i did bring somebody here he was like okay i asked you not to bring nobody here i said i know but i didn't have no other ride he said okay cool i let them stay but you can't tell none of the people that might come by in the middle of the night and i was like okay cool (sighs) Go tell my friend, I'm like, friend, you can stay here with me. So we landed in the bed. He said, now make sure you buy your phone because, you know, we may need to call you at any time of the night. At this point, I'm starting to get a little weary, but I didn't give this man my my W9, I10, not W9, W4, the I9 form. I didn't give him all my information, my direct deposit information. So I'm like, this is a legit job. Like, I got the offer letter. Like, I'm about to be hired. I go to sleep about 1.30 in the morning. He calls my phone. He was like, I've been calling you. You ain't answer. They they are about to come by your room. You need to get out the room. So I'm like, okay, cool. I go out the room. He's sitting outside of the room. He was like, let me take you with me because I don't want you to get in trouble. Anyway, obviously, we know where this is going. So the man assaulted me at his place in the middle of Shreveport, Louisiana, and he recorded it. And um, so I left there still like I thought him off of me or whatever the case may be. He gave me a check and he said, don't say nothing. Cash this check and, you know, just be quiet about whatever happened. He ended up texting me a couple months later um, and basically blackmailed me because I was a prostitute. He had, you know, he had obvious communication with the prostitute. Um, and so how was I going to fight the fact that I was on video with somebody that I was obviously talking about, like getting money from. Um, and so I was doing something illegal. So how was I going to say that he was doing something illegal? Um, but before he even like contacted me, um, I just said like, okay, I asked for one trick to get me out of this. And you gave me what I asked for. Wasn't the money. But you sent the trick to teach me my goddamn lesson. And uh, that was the last time I prostituted. Mm. And, you know, I'm trying to bring it together for y'all who are listening. (laughs) This is a perfect example why we should be decriminalizing sex work. This is a perfect example why sex is work. And if we create and sex work is work. And when we decriminalize it, we are able to allow people when shady ass shit happen, they can go to the police when they get assaulted, when they get blackmailed, when they get set up in some kind of negative situation, they're able to go to the police and protect themselves because I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm, I'm providing a legal service that I can't get in trouble for. So when somebody does something wrong to me, 
I can actually come to the police and get them to do their fucking job, especially when y'all don't want to fucking defund the police. We want to give them money to do shit that they not really trained to do. So if they have the money to do it, then at least put us as sex workers in a position where we can get them to do their fucking job. (laughs) <laughs> and mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. um so this is why decriminalizing sex work is the way to go so that um sex workers can be out here and in the best safe situation the safest position to if something is happens that's wrong they're not in the situation that Ian just described where I can't do anything because I am over here doing something illegal and what is the police going to say in regards to that and um particularly for women and but but particularly for even queer men, it actually can put us in harm's way to crooked cops who want to sexually assault us as well. So, Mm -hmm. yes, I wanted to give that kind of context, too. So, all right, what's next? What happens next? Once you learn this lesson, this trick, (laughs) not the good one. (laughs) I learned this lesson and I said, well, I got to figure out how to make money. Because at this point, I've been homeless a couple of times. I couch surfed served all my life at this point. Um, And I got to figure out how to be an adult. And I used that charisma to get a job at Office Depot. And uh, my job at Office Depot, I had, like all all people should, I talked myself up and got me a manager position my first job. (laughs) And uh, so I would manage at Office Depot and copy and print. And um, Nine months later, this guy who ends up being the CEO of an organization comes in and I'm tired that I do what black people do, especially black poor people. We put it on and we do what we are asked to even above and beyond what we're asked to do. And uh, before you know it, I turned around and I was working in public health just by complete accident. I was working in public health on the front line. and. Um, that's when life started to shift. Things started to make a lot more sense because during my my time in public health, I worked from health specialist to community health worker to coordinator to manager to director in different capacities. And um, what was so interesting about it is I was getting more and more upset with the bureaucracy and politicking uh, I remember this one organization I was working in. Um, so, somebody wants to talk crazy. Let me give it a second. <laughs> All right. So uh, somebody, um, my, my first time I was like testing people in a group setting. And uh, I remember we um, we got somebody that was... Um, that was reactive and I called my my boss at the time and I'm just like hey what do I do like how do I deliver this news they were like uh well you know you just tell them and you ask them how you know how can you support blah 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 so I told them whatever and they were like nervous that other people were going to find out I'm like no it's confidential you sign the paperwork it's no problem blah 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 I just need you to come to the office tomorrow so we can do the blood draw. Anyway, after the blood draw, this is somebody I'm connected to. So, like, I was, you know, this is, you know, people that I know. Community. This is community. So I came to my job, did the blood draw, and I remember walking out into our open office where we all sit. And after he left, they were, like, clapping like this was Best Buy. And I was like, what are we clapping for? And uh, they said, I mean, for you to, you know, just be getting into this, because I didn't test that my first job. But it was like, for you to just be getting into this and you already found somebody that was positive, like, you only got to find a, a couple more in the next couple months. And I was like, oh, this is a sales job? <laughs> I didn't come here to be in a sales job. <laughs> and we're talking about positive people. And this, well, is, this is the problem that... <laughs> the nonprofit industrial complex when you are doing it in the old school i want to say white but <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> wink wink but i i don't want to 
I, I want you to understand that, you know, sometimes the way it is set up to get funding and to report funding and to continue to get funding, it is based on the outcomes, the deliverables, the numbers, the, uh, you got this funding, how many people can you get tested? And if you want to continue to get this funding, boom, it is based yeah. on, um, you know, it is based on these bullshit ass rules and those rules can actually hinder you from care. It can from caring about the community because you now you're focused on just the numbers or you're going to lose your funding, which that funding pays people's bills, pays people's, you know, their salaries. And so you you're under this pressure to get these numbers. If you have your if you're if you are um, social structure of the the structure of not social structure, the um fiscal structure yeah, yeah. the fiscal structure of your company revolves around these deliverables it just kind of kind of kind of put yourself in a position where you won't care and be tender as you need to be in these situations but also where it's just about the numbers mm -hmm. so i get totally what you're saying over time um i had many of those moments i had many of those moments and i had moments where i wished I was wishing I could do anything for, you know, some of my clients and who were my friends and community and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I couldn't because of, you know, the, the, the business or the organization I was in. And so at some point I just realized that um, I was being tokenized. I was the nigga, the queer nigga that, um, could because I have a raspy voice and tattoos and I sag my pants, I could come into the organization. They was gonna tell me to dress up, but please talk like that and please go out to those places and please corral the people and, and bring them into this space such that we can continue to get these coins. And um the burden is on you. Like we we're we're not going home feeling any type of way because we're just writing our grants. We're just assisting with administrative stuff we're making sure we pay you this little pumpkin seed of corn right because we're going to be behind here but you not only do you bring all your friends here you tell them that they have an sti or hiv or whatever we need you to test them for you take that home with a little bit of money that you can barely pay your stuff with and uh you should be happy that without a degree and without a whole lot of experience, we're letting you move through this system on behalf of your ability to really be burdened with, be burdened by the knowledge that you have of your community and be traumatized with the fact that you have to hold this as secret, right? And uh, at that point, I left, <laughs> left. And I did not want to do any type of Nonprofit work ever again because it cost too much. It cost me too much to do that work. So you're a nonprofit now. <laughs> <laughs> so That's what, a led, good point. what led yeah. to you coming back? And you know, this goes into our conversation about your organization, Normal Anomaly. And yeah. So tell me about how you started to shift and start to feel empowered to do something different and how to lead in a different way. How did you start to learn that lesson? Where did the idea come from? You know, give me a little bit of history of how you and Normal Alamely came to existence in this work. You know, it, so in one of my last jobs before I vowed to just leave nonprofit, I really felt like, and this is just like also honoring the, the platform and spaces that you have created, because what I felt like is that there were all type of people that were, at that time, blogging was the thing, right? And there were all type of blogs. And there were many that were, you know, sexual blogs, and they had pop culture queer blogs, and they had, you know, pop culture blogs, all these kind of blogs. But nobody was talking about like, the academic that wasn't in school, you know what I mean? They weren't talking about like the shit that goes on on the ground, like the, the you know, they weren't talking about things that I, I wanted to talk about. And so um, one day I went to this event at TSU 
and it was with one of my good friends, Mike Webb, was lead, uh, leading it. And hey, uh, they were, hey, Mike, and they were, and they were uh, talking about um, justice and social justice and equality. And uh, I had just left there, and I called my aunt. I said, Aunt, I am feeling so sad that I just don't know my place. I don't have my voice. I don't have any clarity. And I was boohooing, walking down Ennis. Uh, just sad, and she said, "Well, what is it going to take to find your find your voice?" And I said, "I don't know. I need to put some things on paper." And it clicked. Put something on paper. So I started a blog called Norma Anomaly. Uh, the idea was we're more alike than different. People are thinking this, but you're not saying it. Here I go, and I start saying all the things that people were not going to say. Uh, I called myself a rapist because I've, I've been a part of rape culture. I talked about that on the blog during that time. Um, I talked about uh, I, I talked about Usher. Now hold on, and we got a we got a big <laughs> you, that you can't just walk past that. What do you <laughs> describe that concept of what you're talking about when you talk? Yeah, about so I, I called myself a rapist because I've been a part of rape culture. Does that mean you was out here raping people? No, 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 not at all. Yeah, what it really that. means, <laughs> what it really means, what it really means is like when I was when I was younger, going back to me using the charisma to seduce people, right? Um, I would do this to people who were not necessarily unwilling in terms of their body, but I know they didn't particularly desire to have sex with a man, right? Like it was just the heat of the chase. And I think, you know, we call it chase and trade now. I didn't have language then, but like this idea of chasing somebody who is clearly, even if they want to do it, even if it's their desire, they're not ready for it and kind of putting them into this place to like, um, you know, I, I, I think it, it's an expansion of what people see as rape culture. And the reason why I talked about it is because I said men don't often see it like this until we turn it on them, right? So when I talk about, many times when we talk about rape culture, we talk about um, men and women, right? And so when we talk about it, men don't get it. They don't get it because how dare you say I'm a part of culture just because I coerced a woman um, through money or through, you know, power or whatever the case may be to have sex with me. But what happens when a man coerces you was my question. How does that look? Do you feel um, how would you feel if this happened to you? And how we um, define coerce um, me and um, T with Queen and Jay did a review on. Um, it may destroy you by um Michaela um Michaela Cole and she had a you know a, a show she had on um HBO and one of the things that we talked about in our conversation hey queen um is how how different things look and how you can we were talking about how it you set a girl up to who may be interested in you you feel what i'm saying she thinks she's coming over she might be interested in you in regards to be with you, but she thinks she's coming over to hang out with you and other friends. OK, and so because she 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 thinks she's coming over, the reason why she said yes to come over and hang with you is because it's going to be you, other people. It's going to be a group of people. So there's a safety that comes with a group of people. But what she doesn't know is that you have told your friends to mysteriously find something, something to do and somewhere to be. And so now she's in a situation where she's alone with you and you are now trying to persuade her to have sex. And she wouldn't have been in this situation if you hadn't maneuvered the circumstance. And so those type of things are a part of rape culture. It's a part of being responsible and getting enthusiastic consent and really getting and not being that type of manipulative, manipulative person just to have sex with people. And so mm -hmm. I love that you have the idea of expanding your responsibility where it's not just, am I holding you down and taking your pussy? It's not just that. Mm -hmm. It is making the situation being the foundation of the yes 
not being rooted in lies and manipulation. Make the mm-hmm. yes be rooted in, I am honest. I am telling you the situation and I want you to be safe in safety and care and not rooted in manipulation and lies because that too is a part of rape culture. It's not just um, the hold you down, force you to do something mm-hmm. and you say no and I still force you to do it. It's not just that. It's a it's the mm-hmm. coercion, it's a manipulation. That is the culture that leads to those type of negative things. So I'm glad that you added that. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. So I started the blog and the blog did pretty well, surprisingly. Um, And um, when I left, my goal was to figure out how to be a blogger. I said, I'm going to find people who are blogging and making money. And what I found was nobody was actually making money from blogging. Um, (laughs) They were making, I mean, nobody in my circle was making money from blogging. They were making money. it could have been sex work. It could have been a second job. It could have been, you know, commentating ads. There were all these different kinds of things. But I just thought, oh, I could write for a living because somebody's doing it. Um, but I never found anybody, at least in my circle, during that time. And so I started to think, like, how can I live? Like, how can I live? Um, and I wanted to be a writer. So I'm just writing, 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 writing. Um, and then an opportunity came up because I wanted to create some content, an opportunity came up. They said, hey, we think you should apply for this little grant. And I said, how? They said, a fiscal sponsor. And I said, what's a fiscal sponsor? <laughs> so, that, so I ended up calling one of my colleagues, Kennedy Lafton at Montrose Center. And I said, hey, have you ever heard of a fiscal sponsor? I'm looking for one, but I don't exactly know what it is. And he said, oh, we have a nonprofit incubator at the Montreal Center. And I said, do they accept people like me? And he said, yeah, you seem like the perfect candidate for uh, to be in our nonprofit incubator. And uh, from there, we got our first grant to create content. And so we were like doing all digital storytelling. We were doing whatever it took. We started with church because I'm a church queen. And then we went to allyship with trans community because my best friend growing up, uh, growing up ended up transitioning. Um, or has transitioned. I'm sorry. I apologize. And um, and so we did all of this. And as I started to do this, I'm like, this feels good, but I don't feel tangible movement. Like, yes, I can create content, and I love to create content. I think it's important to create content, but I need to feel something. I need to feel like the movement. I need to. And then I start thinking, okay, we're telling the story. How can we change the narrative? And from there, I mean, we went into a bunch of training, some strategic planning, and uh, with the help of Joelle and Jordan, uh, my incredible team who make me look good every single day, uh, and the people that's coming on in a couple of weeks, say, man, <laughs> they, you know, we we are now uh, making real impact, and it's it's a new thing. Right. Like I'm telling them right now and I tell myself this is hard for me as a Scorpio, but I'm like, fail big, because if you aren't failing, that means you're not innovating. If we are doing something that is already has a blueprint, I don't want to do it. I'm not interested in it. If we've seen it done too many times and I'm not saying like we're doing any, you know, all novel, all innovative things. But I'm saying if we're not doing it in a different way. If we're not at the risk of failing and losing a grant constantly because we're trying to do something new, then that is not where I want to be. So every day we come to the job and we like, we do our work and we think, okay, what's next? How do we innovate? How do we expand? And I say I, I, say I work at a nonprofit or I lead a nonprofit because 501c3 status and grants is my main way to, to do this. But we want a business for community. <laughs> we want a business to build community, to create community, to empower community, to give back to the community. And that's the type of work I want to do. The community makes the decisions on what success looks like. I'm not here to tell you that getting in care is what you should do. I'm not here to tell you that getting employed, normally employed, right, is what, what you need to do. But I'm here to say that I can get you there through our transportation program. I'm here to say, if you don't want a regular job, I can put you through a leadership development program with the best in in this work and then launch a business in front of a couple thousand people, right? That's what I'm here to do. 
right? And that's the work that I was called to do. And um, so, I, you know, this is not, um, it is a nonprofit. I do nonprofit work, but this is something, I don't even have a word for this. This is bibbity boppity boo. Okay. Like this is some good, this is some good shit. You know what I mean? This is a good shit. Some, some shit that I go to sleep with every single night. I'm sure you can hear it from my excitement. I go to sleep with this shit every night. I wake up with it early in the morning and I get that. I don't need no coffee. I don't need no smoothie. Many times I need a nut. But other than that, I get on, I get to the office and I am happy every day to do what I do. And, um, I hope this lasts for a long time. And this is the other part. When it stops, we already have a succession plan. Okay. Because I am not supposed, I am supposed to start the leadership. But the, I told y'all, Joel and Jordan and the people that's coming behind me, they already are me and bigger and better and thinking wider and longer. And so I don't plan, when I say I hope this lasts forever, I don't mean me being ED. I mean this feeling of the work. Because this will be left to them to expand and create and co-create and build. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm in love with what I do. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. So you are one of the people that um, Little Nas X featured during his marketing strategy for his last album. I thought that that was amazing. That was amazing that that connection happened. And... You know, we are seeing this kind of new level of visibility in, in regards to trans people, but it also regards to places that queer people are in. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? We did an episode um, last week about um, a gay rapper breaking down barriers in the battle rap areas you know Lil Nas did it in like the pop arena but in the in the battle rap area which is his own particular genre he's literally being on platforms that gay gay rappers have never been on and so how is it making you feel now you know how old are you I'm 34 so 34 how from the time that you came out and the there has been a shift in mm -hmm. visibility there has been a shift in um you know grant landmark um, you know, uh, policies and landmark cases that we have won. Um, so how, what have, what have that shift been like for you living it? And what do you see is the next level to where we need to go um, from your perspective? You know, I think it takes people like you, um, I don't know you, and the people, uh, T.S. Madison was actually my first big interview with my blog. So got to honor people like that that really create space. Um, because what it really takes, <clears throat> people will always ask me, ah, anything that we do as, you know, Black queer people is inherently political, right? Like stepping on the other side of the door, being our authentic self is like political, period. And so people will automatically ask me, like, so why don't you want to be a part of this actual political faction? And I say, yeah, I'm, I'm here for the support of all of that. But really, I know that change happens on the ground. And to be more specific, it happens when people shift the culture. And so what we've been seeing and what the next steps are is this continuation of a shift in culture. And it really takes people you know, like us, that we're sitting here as, you know, you know, both have experience in sex work and we're talking about it in a very comfortable way, right? We're talking about, you know, sex and sexuality and, and queerness and culture in a very comfortable way. And there's going to be people that come by here that's in the movable middle, right? That's where I work in. I work in the movable middle all the time. That's the only thing I care about. If you're going to hate me, go on ahead and hate me. If you like me, good. Let's be in a relationship. But I'm working on the movable middle. But that's going to be people that watch this. It could be two people. It could be 2,000. It could be 3 million people that watch this or listen to this. And they're going to hear this. And they're going to start to notice their own culture around them. And then they're going to be open to more progressive policies, more liberal policies, listening to um, things that they may not have heard of, right? Coming into spaces that they once were uncomfortable with. And then they're going to be 
allies at some point, right? And then they're going to be co-conspirators at some point, right? It's that really important movable middle. And I think what we're seeing is that the work that has been done over the, and I'm getting chills because our ancestors are proud and they don't, you know, they don't many times get the the notoriety and the applause and acclaim that they that they deserve because many of them are unnamed in history books, right? But it's the power of like, just stepping on the other side of the door and being authentic, right? It's the power of um, showing up um, in spaces and seeing people, right? And speaking to people and, and, and all of those things that literally shift the culture. And so for me, I'm just proud that like, you know, uh, I had an argument, not an argument, but a debate on Facebook. Somebody was like, you know, Lil Richard did it long before Lil Nas X did it. I said, no, Lil Richard did it so that Lil Nas X can do it because Lil Richard couldn't do it like Lil Nas X did it, right? He paved the way for Lil Nas X to do something like that. But it's also like just understanding that that's the shift in culture. And guess what? That means that Lil Nas X, now who he gonna pave the way for? That's the power. And that's what I'm getting excited about because it's not about going back to secession, right? When Diamond says, I'm tired of talking, I'm tired of creating content, I'm going to live, you know, a secluded, sexy life with all of my men, right? Like, what's who are you creating space for? And we see it, right? I see, even though I'm young and I still got a, you know, young girl, I, and I still got a long way to go. I'm, you know, I'm not legendary fish yet, but I will be one day. And the point is, um, you know, how am I creating space? And so I'm intentional about like, like that, because that's where the change comes. When more people see space created, when more people are having these conversations, when more people are doing that groundwork, um, then we see the, see the culture shift. And um, I'm just looking forward, like, for for a nigga from Lamarck to be a part of an organization that the largest pop black queer icon thus far has put together, I can't wait for what comes next in the shift of culture and being seen and visible. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I really want to talk about We'll just point out this concept of the movable middle. Um, Jay from T with Queen and Jay. Um, Jay, hey Jay. Um, she was on Grapevine, and it wasn't in this context that we're talking about it now, but kind of, kind of, they were talking about um, you know Democrats versus versus Republican, and and she was making a point of how it is actually an intellectual um, st- strategy to talk to that movable middle. It's, she was talking in a concept, I'm, no, I'm not gonna go to the Klansmen to help me move, to do to move this vote in my direction. I'm gonna go to that racist white liberal. <laughs> I'm not gonna go to the Klansmen because they don't give a fuck about me. I'm gonna go to that liberal that is colorblind, that maybe got a pussy pink pussy hat on that voted for Hillary, <laughs> but they still wanna pet your hair like you a pet and hold your purse or, you know, call the police on you and stuff like that weaponize the police with their white tears it might be that person we might have to strategically engage with them the movable middle um and so it that's what came up when i was thinking about what you said because it is literally an uh intellectual strategy to say hey i'm not going to even focus on if you don't like me if you don't like me you don't want to fuck with me you disagree with me i think that that is a waste of time I think because most of the time, if you engage in conversation with somebody like that, who, uh, you know, a debatable conversation with somebody like that, they're actually not going to go out of that conversation learning. They're not going to go out of the conversation because they're too busy trying to rebut you. They're too busy set in stone in what they what they think. They don't have the intelligence or the integrity to really look into what you're talking about. It's really that person that is in the movable middle is really that person who is on the fist like, you know, I really don't know about this. I really don't know. And I I wish, I wish I could learn some more. Can you tell me about this? They're asking questions. No, we're not talking about sea lining, which is just asking questions just to be pretend to be mm-hmm. dumb. We're actually asking people who are really curious about learning something they didn't know. Oh, I thought that this was this. Oh, um, I don't want 
um, trans kids being abused by their parents, you know, I think this them transitioning is abusive if, if it's just too soon for them to be making those kind of decisions. They shouldn't be getting surgeries at 12. They could change their mind. But you don't understand that actually you can't get surgeries at 12. You have to be 18. <laughs> they're, they're, that rhetoric that you're thinking about is actually not true. And so can, yeah. are, are they going to be open to those uh, that that movable middle is going to be open to new information and changing their mind about new information and when we're trying to educate them. And it is a, a very intellectual strategy for us to focus on that. And to be honest, if we're trying to as leaders, if we're trying to avoid burnout, avoid being stressed, dying fucking early and 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 these are the people while it is work it's not as much work as these people over here who hate you i feel like the people who are um d dealing in that realm it is too stressful it is too um that's that's not for me i'm not i'm not that person mm -hmm. i want i want somebody that i can see that i'm gaining ground with that i am it, can it be slow yes but i need to see mm -hmm. some type of movement and understanding if i'm getting somebody where i'm just constantly arguing with you arguing with you about the same old fucking bullshit that is a waste of time i think it's important that you pointed out the um the movable middle because that is not a waste of time those are the that's because they're movable <laughs> the people who are not movable, it doesn't do anything for us, baby. Yeah. They're still going to vote Republican. Yeah. They're still going to hate you because you're gay. They're, even if they're yeah. black, they're still going mm -hmm. to, you know, they're going to do, or they're still going to think your quote unquote lifestyle is wrong because it's against their religion and they think you're going to hell. Even if they say, well, I condone it and I don't want you to, um, you know what they love to say? Well, I, I love the I love the person, but I don't love the sin. You know, the, even if they yeah. say that, that's just a nice way of saying I'm never going to agree with you. I don't fuck with what you got going on. I don't think of that as a part of you. I think of that as the devil. I think of that as um, a choice that you are making. So they're not believing you when you say, this is not my choice. This is who I am. They're not mm -hmm. believing you. And so it's time to divest from those type of people and really focus, focus on the people who are in the movable middle and who are, who are actually, you know, going to like you said take that succession into from being somebody that may have been against you to somebody who is now an ally who is now a co-conspirator who is now literally your friend and a part of your um family so yes i love mm -hmm. that you said that so what's the next steps for normal anomaly <laughs> in your mind and um you know what kind of programming are y'all having right now the normal anomaly this is the ED talking for just a second, and then I'll get back to my personality. But the Normal Anomaly is an organization that centers Black queer persons to overcome barriers and stigmas and problematic narratives to actualize a new normal. And we do that through- Come on, mission. Give us this mission speech. Come on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. We all have it. We have it wrote down. Yeah. We have we have the one that's 50 words. We got the one that's 150 words. We got the one that's 250 words. We ready for you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we do this through three ways, uh, direct services, capacity building and research, and advocacy programs. Um, so through that, we um, have a leadership development um, for the general community, um, specifically focused on, a lot of our programs are um, mostly focused on, when we say Black queer, we mean the whole LGBTQIA plus spectrum. But most of our clients and or people that participate in our stuff are Black gay men, Black trans women, and Black trans men. Um, so, you know, pretty cool, interesting mixture because Black gay men are nothing specifically without Black trans women. Um, so Many have slept on my couch. <laughs> <laughs> Many have slept on my couch. Right. <laughs> so... Um, so um, we uh, we have a lot of advocacy programs, um, things focusing on HIV, but we like to say that we focus on the social determinants of equity um, instead of the social determinants of health. Uh, the social determinants of health are such a small microcosm of the really large structural problems that we as Black queer people face. And so 
we want to like expand outside of like this idea of just like things like employment and and all this kind of stuff we want to talk about like connectedness and we want to talk about community building and right like like all those kind of things um and so soon enough we are going to be having a music festival uh by the time this comes out so i can say this now uh we will have announced our lineup and it is full of black queerness um hosted by crystal smith a beautiful black trans woman and uh chaos talks from these uh from new york i'm sorry and brandon sanders from miami on the roster we have uh sean west who's a barber rock from right here in houston and trey ward from oakland um sissy noby and vaca redu hey. bounce artists because i mean why wouldn't we do wow. some bounce artists right uh, and then seven deep with his sexy ass from he from dc but he lives in nyc um and then it's headlined by duran bernard super excited to to, to oh, hear him my fellow youtube and, buddy <laughs> and uh don richard um formerly from Dunity kane so super excited about that and we're really creating a space we're launching all these businesses um it's going to be doing black gay pride weekend and um, a whole moment, a whole mood. So we get to create stuff like that. The next step for us, um, to be honest, you know, we are great. We are grateful for the ability so far to, you know, just in full transparency. We're lucky to. We started with a seventy five hundred dollar grant, and uh, this year easily we're going to hit seven hundred fifty thousand dollars you know, three, four years. Uh, I plan on us getting to a million. Uh, my goal would be to be a grant maker, um, specifically to Black trans organizations that are grossly underfunded in this sector. Um, especially in I, the South. Especially in the South. Uh, so that is my goal. My goal is to continue to create these moments in community and that they grow and they get larger and larger. And then we become, we use some of these ancillary general op funds instead instead of just like padding my salary, which I like to live nice, but I don't take a large salary. Um, but um, instead of padding my salary and, and just like expanding so quickly, I would like to give it to our, you know, to, to specifically trans that organizations that are really doing the work here in the South. And so um, I'm hoping in the next two years, we can move from not just being direct services, capacity building and research and um, advocacy programs to actually funding. Because right now, like in our Project Liberate, we have a, a nonprofit side and then a for-profit side. And our nonprofit side, we have uh, three people of trans experience uh, out of the, the seven. Um, and it's two women of trans experience and one man of trans experience. And so, like, I know where the work is going to be doing, and this is funded for three years. So I'm hoping that after these, you know, three years that we're going to be able to, instead of just launching the business, bitch, sugar some money, like, do something with this. That's the hope. Well, I want to thank you for spending some time with me. I love you. Every time I am in one of your at one of your events, I am treated like a queen, and I, you know, I appreciate you. I am I always feel like I'm included. Included. I don't feel. Not talking about me personally. I'm talking about me as a black trans woman. I always feel like. Uh, when I come into a space, it's not just a gay man space. It's not just a gay black queer man space. It is, it literally is included of all black queer experiences and you make sure that all of us are represented. So I always feel like, um, you know, this is home. This is a community. It doesn't feel like it's one voice. It feels like I am included in this space, not only personally, but just as my identity. So I really appreciate that in, in what, what y'all do. And yeah, I want to thank you for being on the show. <laughs> oh, this was, this was absolutely wonderful. I'm, <clears throat> I first heard you speak really quickly. First heard you speak in a very weird space. It was, um, you were with Dee Dee, and we were trying to figure out this uh, Black trans woman who had been killed here locally in Houston. And, you know, my, my G-Ma Dee Dee came in, and she was about the work. 
and she was upset as you know as she should be and she was about to work and Atlantis was sitting right by me my other G Ma sitting right by me my my best friend Mia was sitting right right on the other side and everybody was in you know it was very heavy it was very heavy and you got up at this time you had your crown that's what I call your hair at the time your your crown you had your crown hairstyle and you got up they introduced you as you know a podcaster and content creator gave you a whole thing and I remember seeing you but I knew nothing about that and you got up and I I just remember feeling free um and feeling like seen and 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 it was possible and interestingly enough after you spoke that's when her friends came in and was able to identify her it was just a really weird and surreal moment so I want to honor your ability to you know to free the people through your words thank you thank you thank you tell the people where they can find you find my ass on um, all social media platforms at enl hot out and the normal anomaly you can find them on all social platforms at the normal anomaly our website is normalanomaly.org and I will have all of that stuff link in the bottom and make sure y'all follow them and support. If you got some coins, drop them some coins. And yeah, we will see y'all next week. Thank y'all for listening. Have a wonderful day.